then for the last talk of the session, uh, Senri Chen will talk about the learnability of power models. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Senri Chen and I'm a graduate student at University of Chicago. Today I'm very happy to uh, give this talk about the learnability of polynoise, which is based on the recent work with uh, Yun Chao Liu, Matthew Autumn, Alarisa Saif, Bill Pfefferman, and Liang Jia. Uh, let's jump right in. So the topic of my talk today will be about quantum noise. The starting, po starting point is very natural. That is, we know that realistic quantum systems are noisy, and the noise is like arguably one of the major challenge for, for us to build a practical quantum computer system to and to find any practical quantum advantage. So in order to deal with noise, one thing we want to do is first to learn the noise, to characterize the noise. For example, uh, this figure is a figure I taken from uh, IBM Quantum's website, and this is the calibration data of one of their device. You can see that like the synod gate are noisy, and there are other noise source. And today's talk will also be focusing on how to characterize noise. Why do we want to care about noise? Well, there are several reasons. The first thing is that we simply just want to understand uh, the physics of our underlying hardware and to know which part uh, is more noisy so that we, want, we need innovation to improve them. However, there could also be other software application. For example, with the knowledge of noise, we can do error mitigation uh, to improve the performance of quantum computing. And we can even, for example, design better error correcting code that might have like a better threshold uh, given the knowledge of bias noise or other structure of the noise. Okay, so now, now we know that uh, there are applications for learning noise. What do we mean? So then what do we mean to learn the noise in the first hand? Well, if we think about uh, the components of a quantum circuit, uh, we, can, we know that uh, there could be a, a, a set of state preparation we can do. There could be a bunch of unitary gate we can apply and there is some measurement we can do. And by learning a noise uh, in the quantum circuit level, what I mean is basically, okay, uh, we want to learn, we know that uh, there are some certain gate set we want to apply, but we, because of noise, we don't know what exactly it looks like. And basically we want to characterize all the state preparation, all the gate and all the measurement here. So when it comes to learning something in the quantum system, the first thing we can think about is, okay, to jump, how, how about we just do tomography? Let's see, uh, how we should do that. Well, for example, if we if we uh, trust our state preparation and we think we can do a good measurement and we just want to know what is the unitary we're applying here. Well, the thing we can do is just apply a process tomography. And also if we want to know uh, what the state look like and we have a good measurement, we can do state tomography. And uh, uh, similarly, if we, if we trust our state preparation but we want to characterize our, me our measurement, we can do a detector tomography. The problem here is like, which of these are experimentally relevant? Well, here I want to argue that what happened in the experiment is like all of these components are noisy. For example, if you look at some data of like current uh, quantum computing devices, you will see that the two qubit gate noise is arguably comparable to the spam noise, which means the state preparation and measurement noise. So that you cannot simply, for example, ignore the spam noise to characterize the unitary noise. Um, so now this brings a natural question. So now since all the separation measurement and the unitaries are noisy, what, or if there is anything that can be reliably learned about the quantum noise, or are there something that we can never learn about the quantum noise? Well, to understand this question, there's a formalism called gauge freedom or gauge degree, uh, gauge transform that can help us understand this. So let's start with a very simple example. Uh, for example, think, Think about we only have one qubit and we do this experiment. We prepare a computational basis zero state and do a computational basis measurement. Uh, so in the ideal case, we should always see a zero. But let's say in the experiment, we see we measure one with 2% of chance. How should we interpret this experiment? Well, there could be a different interpretation. For example, you can think that maybe 2% of error happening in the state preparation, but we have a perfect measurement. 
Or we can think that there are 2% of noise all on the measurement, but we have a perfect state perversion, or it can be like roughly 1% on the state perversion, 1% on the measurement. So there is a continuum of different possibility. The point here, okay, here I want to say that here, assume the noise is depolarizing for simplicity. The point is that there, these possibility are in some sense indistinguishable. Even if you can do any perfect unitary control uh, here, the reason is basically because a depolarizing noise commute with any like a unitary control. So you cannot use like any unitary control to distinguish between this possibility. So this will really give you a like a continuum of uh, possibility, possible interpretation of the experiment, which we call gauge freedom. And uh, in some sense, they're indistinguishable. There are no way for experimentalists to decide what is really happening in an, uh, on your device. This effect is more general than just for spam noise, uh, which can be understand use the formalism of gauge transformation, which is like studied, for example, in the literature of gate set tomography. So how does this uh, works? Well, first let's think about, we have a noisy gate set. Here by gate set, I just mean uh, all possible separation, all possible measurement and all possible unitary. So we have a recipe of what what uh, what, what is a gate set we can apply, but we don't know. Uh, what is a realistic gate set look like because of noise? So to do gauge transform, let's think of there are some uh, invertible map. For now, you can think of it as a quantum channel, but it does not have to be a quantum channel. It just have to be a, a invertible linear map. And okay, so for now, let's don't think. Let's uh, just think of them as some uh, linear map. And uh, to do gauge transform, we do the following. First, for all this uh, initial state, we can prepare well, like, uh, uh, like uh, apply a map M on the state. And for all the measurement here, we will like apply an inverse map M inverse before the measurement. And for all the unitary, noisy unitary here, we'll conjugate it by like an M inverse and uh, map M. For now, let's just assume that after this transformation, all this quantum state is still a valid quantum state and all the channel is still a CBTP map and all the measurements still like a pure value measurement. Everything is still physical. If this is satisfied, then gauge transform will give you like a, a new gate set that is probably different from the original gate set. But here the claim is that the original gate set and the new gate set are indistinguishable uh, under the quantum circuit model. Why is this, why this is the case? Well, um, there's a simple proof for that. So let's think about uh, if you want to do any quantum circuit, any quantum experiment uh, with a specific gate set, then what you can do is just, okay, you ask the, the circuit to prepare some state to apply a sequence of unitary gates and to do a measurement. For example, let's say that you want to do some circuit with this new gate set. Now what we do is to expand it with the gate transform map we just, uh, just defined. Uh, so you see that we get something like this, something like this, the unitary is something like this, the measurement is something like this. And because we assume that M is invertible, we can simply cancel uh, all the M and M inverse. And what we get is just the same circuit using the original gate set. Because these two are exactly the same equivalent circuit, so they will have exactly the same outcome statistics. So that is the reason why you cannot distinguish them. Uh, and because this holds for any possible uh, quantum circuit using your gate set, so they are arguably indistinguishable. So, so this tells us, uh, yes, maybe you can also construct as like a continuum of possibility uh, of possible uh, underlying gate set that is related by a gauge degree of freedom. Um, and they're indeed indistingu indistinguishable. Uh, and here I also want to mention that the gauge transform, indeed they have an additional constraint. They need to preserve physicality. For example, you cannot, uh, like make your noise rate to become some minus 1%. That is not allowed. So this means that usually the gauge transform will have some, like some finite range, but uh, still there's, there's a continuum of uh, possibility. So now if we think about, we want to learn some property of a noisy gate set, this can be written just as a functional F of uh, which takes the input of, the, of your gate set. For example, F can be like the average fidelity of your gate and your spam fidelity. Uh, something like that. Now with this definition, it's very easy to define the notion of learnable function and unlearnable function. Here, learnable function basically means that if our function f is invariant, uh, I mean, 
uh, under any gauge transform, then we call it a learnable function. And on the other hand, if our function f can take different value uh, on different uh, noise gates that, that are related by gauge transform, then we say it is unlearnable because different gauge, different uh, gates that are indistinguishable, but they can give you different value of f. This, will tell, this means that there's no way for you to learn the real value of f. So in the previous simple example, the total amount of spam noise is something learnable. But if you want to individually learn what is the operation and what is the measurement noise, it is in like a become unlearnable function. And the goal of this work, roughly speaking, is why we want to understand the learnability of a general function of a noise model. <coughs> Excuse me. And for our contribution of this work, we are being less ambitious and we only focus on the learnability of, for a poly noise model which I will define in a moment. But what we promise, uh, I can promise you to do is that we can learn, we can characterize the learnability of a poly noise model very precisely. And we can give explicit protocol to extract all the learnable information. And we also doing an experiment to, to test the relevance of our theory. So, okay, let's, let's start a slightly more technical part. In order to introduce what is a poly noise model, let's first define what is a poly channel. Well, for NQB poly channel, it is very simple. It's just a stochastic mixture of different poly operator P according to a probability distribution, small PA, which is usually on the called the poly error rate. Okay, the point is that every poly channel can also be equivalently written in an alternative form, which is something like this. Uh, and it is parameterized by a factor lambda B. Here, lambda B is defined as like you input a poly into poly B into a poly channel and uh, taking the trace of PB of the like output PB, then normalize it. And this factor is called the polyfidelity. The polyfidelity and the poly error rate are two equivalent parameterization of a polychannel. Here, there's a geometric under, uh, way to understand the polyfidelity, which is quite simple. Consider a single qubit uh, face flip noise channel that there are 70% chance there's no noise and 30% chance there's a V noise. And if you're acting this on the block sphere, you will see that the, the blocks the block sphere is like shrink in the X and Y axis. And the shrink rate uh, is exactly represented by the polyfidelity, uh, which is like 40%. So here I just want to mean that polyfidelity is, uh, yeah, has a geometric meaning. And here, uh, we'll, so we are focusing on learning the polyfidelity. And with a, so after defining a poly uh, channel, we'll define poly noise model. Well, the, so our noise model contain these four assumptions. First, we ignore the noise of single qubit unitary. And secondly, for any possible multi-qubit Clifford gate, we assume there's a gate dependent poly noise attached to that. So that a noisy G uh, tilde is modeled by G following a uh, poly channel lambda G. And we also assume that the spam noise has some unknown, unknown poly noise, uh, sorry. And the noise is not too large. It's like some technical assumption. Here I want to mention that this kind of assumption are somehow standard because there are a technique called randomized compiling, which you can find in this paper, that is by uh, under reasonable assumption assumption by inserting single qubit poly uh, polygate, you can always twirl your noise in the system to a uh, like poly noise model. Okay, so now the main question of we want to answer is given a gate gate dependent poly noise channel lambda g, is it learnable or not? Here, just to remind everyone by learnable, what I really mean is like spam in spam robustly or spam independently learnable. What is the state of the art of this question? Well, there's a technique called cycle benchmarking, which has also has already been be experiment, experimentally demonstrated that can be, help us to learn the this lambda G up to certain uh, degeneracy. For example, in this paper, you see that they can learn the, some polyfidelity, but for certain polyfidelity uh, attached to a CX gate, they can only learn a geometric mean of or average of two poly error rate. It is unclear whether this is because of a limitation of the method of cycle benchmarking or is there a fundamental limit? And basically in this work, we give a complete answer to this question. Uh, that is, we basically see that cycle benchmarking in some sense is optimal we, uh, after you're doing some trick. Uh, and this can, some, some of this degeneracy are uh, related to the issue of gauge freedom so that there are some fundamentally unlearnable uh, information. Okay, so let's just present our main result. Uh, here's the result. So given a Clifford gate G 
and the polyoperated PA, let's focus on the gate dependent uh, noise channel lambda G. We show that a polyphatic lambda A is learnable if and only if the Clifford gate G preserves the pattern of PA. So pattern of an NQB polychannel is defined as an NQBB string, such that we replace whenever there's an X, Y, or Z, we replace by one. Whenever there's an identity, we replace by zero. So for example, let's consider two qubits. There are four different possible patterns. And uh, if, I, if we focus on a C0 gate, we know that C0 will, will change IX to IX, which is unchanged. So, I, so C0 preserves the pattern of IX. So our theorem says that lambda IX is spam robustly learnable. And C0 will change YY to something like uh, ZX, I guess. So lambda YY is also learnable. Uh, but on the other hand, because C0 will change XX to XI and change XI to XX, uh, so the pattern change from 1, 1 to 1, 0. So lambda XX and lambda XI are both unlearnable. This is our first theorem. So the change of C0 to all the 16 different possible polys pattern can be written in such a pattern transfer graph. So our second theorem, second theorem is like going a step forward. So informally, we can show that uh, any product of polyfidelity from lambda A1 to lambda AM is learnable if and only if they lie on the cycle of the pattern transfer graph. What do I mean? Well, for example, uh, let's consider the product of lambda XX and lambda XI, which because it forms a cycle from 1, 1 to 1, 0 and going 1, 0 back to 1, 1, our theorem says that they are learnable. So in, the, in our paper, we make it like much more rigorous. Uh, so the theorem to really decide the learnability of any linear function of the log polyfidelity uh, lambda a. So it's like for all the linear function, it forms a linear space, and we characterize like which part of the linear space, learnable space, and which is not. And we will further remark that in the low noise region, uh, this function is really close to zero. So any learnability the learnability of any function of lambda g can be well approximated to the first order uh, using this theorem. For example, we can use this to de approximately decide all the learnability for the poly error rate. For example, in our paper in the C0, we can say that we can list all the learnable polyfidelity and the first order learnable poly error rate. And we can also show that there are only two degrees of freedom that is unlearnable. So in the rest, like three minutes, I want to like give a quick sketch of the proof. Like, how do we, so our proof is dividing into two parts. The first is the, for the learnable part, how do we learn them? And secondly, for the unlearnable part, how do we say that they are really unlearnable? So let's start with a simple example. Uh, if a, a clever gate G uh, like preserves certain poly, like GPA is exactly equal to PA, we, we argue that cycle benchmarking in this case can give a spam robust estimate for lambda A. So how does cycle benchmarking work? Well, cycle benchmarking will start with prepare some like a single qubit a stabilizer uh, stabilizer state. And at the end, they will do some poly measurement. And for now, let's assume that we just want to learn the gate G we want to learn is just C0. Then we will like concatenate the multiple copy of C0 and uh, interleaving them with some single qubit poly twirling gate. The poly twirling is used to make all the noise into a poly channel. And uh, so basically what we'll get is like, we just write down the, the gate dependent poly channel here as some lambda. For now, and now let's assume like, for example, we want to learn lambda ix. We know C0 will preserve ix. So our analysis will be using a like Heisenberg picture. Let's, let's think of we are measuring ob observable ix at the end and we want to propagate the observable to the beginning of the circuit. So we will see like what happened. So the first step is that when we measure ix, uh, ix will have like, a, there will be a factor psi ix, which is like the, polyfidelity associated with the measurement noise. Now we propagate it through the single qubit poly layer because we poly operator will only like give you a plus or minus sign of when you conjugate like poly with another poly will give you a plus minus sign and this can be corrected. So we can always like ignore the plus minus sign. The next step is to propagate IX uh, through the C0 channel, C0, which will not change IX and then the then the poly, then the poly uh, channel lambda, which will pick up a polyfidelity lambda ix in your expression, and going through everything again, we'll pick up another ix. Again, we will pick up another ix, and finally, we will multiply this oper operator to any initial state, and this will give you another factor of lambda 
uh, IXS here, this is something related to the state provision noise. So we look at what we get. So we, ha we have a uh, some factor related to the stem noise and some factor lambda IX to the T's power because we can change the number of concatenation layer. So we can really change the value of T. Uh, thus, just change the T and do a curve fitting. We can have a stem independent uh, estimation for the lambda IX. This is how cycle benchmarking work. And for the second part, uh, if G P A does not equal to P A, but they have the same pattern, then it, it, we can show that there exists a single cubic, cubic clifficate state such that uh, concatenated with G, it will preserve P A. So uh, the, the, our protocol will be very simple. For example, if you want to learn lambda uh, the uh, X Z, but C not will change X Z to Y Y, but we can find some single cubic gate uh, to, like square root Z and square root X to change Y Y back to X Z. But just to remind everyone, we have assumed single cubic gate is noiseless. So that is the reason why we can add them into a circuit and merge them into a layer of single cubic gate. So if we have a if we measure XZ here, XZ will change to YY by the single cubic gate and then change back to XZ by the C naught. And then we can pick up a, a lambda XZ and doing a similar thing, we pick lambda XZ to the second power. And in a similar way of curve fitting, we can like we can learn lambda XZ uh, spam robustly. And finally, uh, we can also use this method to learn any polyfidelity on the cycle. For example, if we start with ZZ and C0, we change Z to IZ and pick up a lambda IZ. And similarly, change it back to ZZ and pick it up a uh, lambda ZZ. So this will give us a way to span robustly estimate the geometric mean of lambda ZZ and lambda IZ. So, th so this will complete the proof of our learnable part. And, and for the unlearnable part, just one slide, uh, we will show that any cut in the pattern transfer graph will give you a valid gauge transform, uh, gauge transformation. Uh, so for example, uh, when, you, when you cut here, you, you can increase all the polyfidelity lambda xi, lambda I, yi by a factor of eta and the other one div uh, divide them by a factor of eta. And we can prove this a gauge transform. So there's no way to, dis to notice this transform in real experiment. And using the fact that the cycle space and the cut space are actually orthogonal or complement in the theory of graph theory, we can conclude that the only thing that is learnable is only those living in the cycle space. Okay, and for more detail, we refer to the read our uh, paper. Yes, and I just I'll, I want to use this one more slide to show that um, we can use this theorem to 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 argue for all possible uh, Clifford case set about the learnability and how many unlearnable degree of freedom is there. Okay, uh, but for the interest of time, I, I think I will just quickly skip this uh, uh, experiment part. But the message here is that we use our theorem to learn the, to learn all the learnable degree of a, of a CNOT gate in the IBM's quantum computing devices. And uh, we can, because we, we have seen that for CNOT, there are two degree of freedom. Uh, T degree of unlearnable freedom. And uh, we, ca we can characterize for the learnable polyfidelity, we can learn the poly error rate. And for, for the unlearnable one, we can characterize the ambiguity due to gauge transform. And we also test this assumption. Like for example, if we know that if, if we can do perfect state preparation, then actually there's a no issue of uh, gauge unlearnability, uh, gauge, gauge freedom. And uh, we test this assumption. Basically, if we make the assumption of perfect state preparation and we try to learn everything again, we can see that the estimate we get is like far away from the physical region we estimated using the gauge transform. But this uh, the the message here is that uh, the state preparation is actually cannot be perfect, uh, and our method can, can only can even be used to like lower bound the value of state preparation noise here. So I guess the message of this slide is just saying that uh, we really need to consider the issue of unlearnability in. Uh, nowadays, quantum computing devices. Anyway, here I give I will give a summary of of our work. So basically, we study the issue of learnability of poly noise, and we mapping the noise learnability to to a pattern transfer graph, showing that okay, the cycle space corresponding to everything that is learnable, and uh, in, and the so called cycle benchmarking with some single qubit Turing trick can be used to learn all the learnable information. So for some open question, well. There's something we can consider about. For example, we consider a learnability consistent method to do error quantum error mitigation. And we can consider time and sample complexity for learning all the learnable degree. 
And also we can think about like, can we compact the unlearnability by going beyond the model of quantum circuit, for example, using QDIT or using mean circuit measurement, something like that. Okay, so with it, I would like to thank you. I thank all of my collaborators. And welcome to accept any question. Okay, well, thanks a lot uh, Sanui, for this talk. Uh, so again, uh, if you have any questions, please put it in the Discord. And so yeah, in the meantime, uh, uh, yeah, I, I was wondering about this uh, sample complexity and the complexity for uh -huh. the learning algorithms. Can you say a bit more about it? Yes, sure. So so currently, there have been some work uh, studying the sample complexity for learning polychannel. Yeah, uh, and this is correct. But most of the this work is treating a polychannel as a black box. So you can input any state to the black box. You can do any measurement. You can even like do it using entanglement or something like that. But here, uh, we're not, we're not, we do, do not have access to a black box. We, what we have access to is like, uh, uh, well, so I would say something like, uh, yeah, something like this. The polychannel always come from always followed by a gate G. So this is one thing. The other thing that we assume there's a spam noise in the uh, in the state in the uh, like uh, in the state operation part and the measurement part. And also the parameter we want to learn is not necessarily all the polyfidelity. The parameter where we should be able to aim that learning is all the learnable degree of lambda G. And in this case, I think the study of sample complexity will be like more complicated. Uh, and because of the I mean, if you want to make it spam robust and you want to learn all the degree of freedom, uh, it is not clear, like just using like stabilizer covering, you can uh, uh, like extract everything. Um, yeah, so maybe. It's... So, so <laughs> your, your, the, algorithm, the learning algorithm that you give, what is its uh, sample and, and uh, time complexity? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what I can say is like uh, about the, like for the specific example of learning say not okay uh, if we if we don't care about the if we don't care about the learnability issue i mean we we have like perfect separation and the measurement then the sample complexity is like two to the n uh, roughly if you want to learn all the uh, all the polyfidelity you want to go through all the uh, it's like okay it's like two to the n here n is two but here if you when you have to take into the account of learnability you actually have to do like two configuration one is the original circuit the other one is the circuit with like uh, uh, like single qubit turning. And I think this uh, roughly doubles the number of sample uh, you, you need to do. So I would say uh, in terms of the like, computations uh, that you're doing? Yes, uh, sorry, uh, in terms of, uh, no, just so if your goal is to learn the, learn the for example, learn a single thing not, uh, I mean, you need to do first. You need to do this two set two setting of experiment, and for each experiment, you need to like like two to the n number of two, uh, roughly two order two to the n of number two extract all the polyfidelity. Thanks. So yeah, I don't see any other questions. So uh, thanks again for this, uh, for this mm -hmm. talk, and I would like to thank uh, all the speakers and participants of this conference. And uh, really big thanks also to the to the organizers of this conference as this is the end of the conference. So, thanks everyone.